I'm Elena Hudgens Lyle. And I'm Harvinder Vadva. We're the hosts of Inappropriate Questions, and we're back with season three. With some fantastic guests, we break down questions like Is asking where are you from appropriate small talk? Is it okay to ask a coworker how much do you make? Should you ask a polyamorous person, do you get jealous? Inappropriate Questions Season 3. Available now on the CBC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. This is a CBC Podcast. I'm Dr. Brian Goldman. This is White Coat Black Art. Canadians mostly admire doctors. A 2021 survey in Canada placed MDs fourth on the list of most respected professions, right behind firefighters and nurses. That approval has never been universal. Canadian doctors have been shot at for performing abortions. Lately, the pandemic response has become a flashpoint for disapproval of healthcare people. This is medical tyranny! I asked the honest questions where you guys lie. You guys all lie. Dr. Bonnie Henry said that there's no way we would implement a vaccine passport, and now we have the vaccine passport. This fall, protesters against vaccine mandates and passports demonstrated outside hospitals in Toronto, Vancouver, Alberta, and elsewhere. This week, I want you to meet a colleague who recently received a death threat for doing two things that I and a lot of other doctors do. She vaccinates Canadians against COVID and is quite vocal about it. Her name is Neely Kaplan Murth. Um, just give me one second. I'm just going to lock my office door. I'll be right back. Neely, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Hey, hey, there we are. Finally, you locked your door. My front door? Absolutely. I cannot leave my door open even for a moment anymore. Yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm doing this from my home office and my front door is not locked right now. So I'm, uh, I feel a little more secure, but uh, wow, that's, uh, we'll, we'll get into that, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Kaplan Mirth is a family doctor in Ottawa. She does research as a medical anthropologist. She writes about health policy and politics and co-hosts the podcast rxadvocacy.ca. Even before COVID vaccines became available, she advocated for family docs to play a central role as vaccinators. She even organized five mass vaccine clinics herself, which she called Jabapaloozas. Dr. Neely kaplan Mirth, welcome to White Coat Black Art. Thank you. So how is work and life being a physician with a target on your back these days? Yeah, it's pretty scary. And, you know, ironically, we designed our Jabapalooza shirts with this big target on the front. We weren't really thinking of it as that when we did it, but now I'm afraid to have any of the um, dozens of volunteers and all the hundreds of people who came to Jabapalooza. I'm afraid for them to be walking around in Jabapalooza shirts too, lest they be targets. For those Canadians who may not be familiar with it, what is Jabapalooza? So... As a family doctor, back at the end of December of 2020, beginning of January 2021, as vaccine for COVID-19 became available, I was advocating pretty hard for public health to include family doctors in the rollout of vaccines since we give our patients all the other vaccines. And by being vocal and saying, you know, we can do this, eventually we were given the opportunity to immunize our patients. And then I found myself in a situation where a lot of other people who didn't have a family doctor came to me and asked if I would help them so that they could also get their vaccine. So I first held a a day in my office where I immunized, I don't know, two or 300 of my own patients. And then I said to 200 or 300 other people, okay, fine, you're not my patients, but I understand you, you can't do this. So I'm going to help out. And I ended up calling this event Jabapalooza. It was actually dubbed that by one of my patients. Um, But it became a really festive, joyous, happy occasion that we did five times. And that means we'll have given about 2,500 doses over the course of the spring and the summer. And that's really helped to get everybody fully vaccinated. And it was amazing. So you talked about the T-shirt with the bullseye on it, uh, with the target on it. Like, I want to know, like, this all sounds very laudatory. So when did you get your first inkling that not everybody was happy with what you were doing? 
So most of the spring and summer, while we were immunizing people, we were reaching out to essential workers, bus drivers, construction workers, teachers, grocers. Um, I was going to the homes of people with disabilities to give them the vaccine. Everybody was appreciative. And there was, you know, the troll kind of scene on social media, on Twitter. There are always people who will insult you and question your education. And there's always the misogyny. And unfortunately, we've seen a huge rise in anti-Semitism and racism as well. So that was sort of there in the background, but it wasn't at my doorstep. One person on social media said to me, I guess in the summertime, when we started talking about immunizing children, that if I were to immunize his child, I would end up in hospital. Now, this is not somebody I know. And, you know, you just block that sort of person and, and move on. But, but somebody actually said that to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's like the politest thing that a person said to me is that I'd end up in hospital. I mean, you know, we've been called, um, especially as women physicians, but we've been called child abusers when we've talked about, you know, the importance of keeping children home from school if they're symptomatic, like all the ways in which we can be insulted, um, most of which are too rude to say on radio, they're tied to this sort of anti-science rhetoric and there is just that implicit racism and sexism as well so like that sort of thing i mean it's rude but i go on with my life but more recently the the reason that as you refer to me having this target on me is you know receiving an actual death threat that was sent through the college of uh, physicians and surgeons of ontario saying that it would be legal and lawful to kill me for having immunized people and then calling me all kinds of Nazi slut things. And just, I mean, it's just full of nastiness. And that's a different thing from being threatened on social media. And what did the college do about the threat? So the college received the threat on October 20th, and they didn't tell me about it until November 1st, which they report was because of a technical glitch because they have a new computer system. They also are not set up to protect doctors. The College of uh, physicians and surgeons is there to protect the public from doctors who do egregious things and who provide subpar care. And the, the college has been going after doctors who've been giving inappropriate exemption letters for vaccine and who've been spreading misinformation. So this may be some pushback in terms of that, but for the college to receive a death threat and to not immediately pick up the phone and phone the police themselves. I mean, I don't know. I don't understand it. I thought that as a good Samaritan, anybody who received a death threat about another person would immediately do that. And this conversation that I had with them, the, the initial conversation, I think they wanted to clarify that this person wasn't my patient. And I was like, no, I've never heard of this person. It's not even somebody I've come across on social media as far as I'm aware, although they may be stalking me. So they accepted that. Okay, so, so you don't know them. Okay, well, when you get the letter that we're going to receive, we're going to send to you, you should probably phone the police. And, uh, and then it was several hours later that they finally sent that to me. And then I... Um, saw what was written and then I phoned the police. And then it was four days later that I finally heard back from the police and now it's two weeks later and I'm still waiting to hear whether anything will be done. Although from what I'm told, this is a very slow process. So, so Neely, in the meantime, what have you done to stay safe? So I've done a number of things. I mean, first of all, I had to ramp up the security in my office. I know other colleagues who keep pepper spray in their offices and I'm five feet tall. I cannot take on somebody who comes into my office and tries to attack me. So it really has to be about keeping my, my space as safe as possible, which means our doors are locked all day. We look through a window to see whether or not it's a patient we know, and then we let them in. We have had situations where a patient that I've been taking care of for 10 years was standing outside the door. He rang the doorbell. I wasn't expecting him. I went and I looked through the door and, you know, because he's wearing a mask and he's being responsible, I couldn't tell who he was and I didn't let him in. And that's heartbreaking to me. Like that is, you know, that is not how I ever imagined that 22 months into the pandemic, I would be feeling in terms of my own safety. And I have to protect my staff and I have to protect my patients when they're in the building. So I've got basically my, my office on permanent alert and the police told me to talk to my kids. And that's a really hard conversation to have when, you know, your children have been out there at Jabba Palooza's with you, you know, and you're so proud of them for having done the right thing. And then you have to explain that people might want to um, cause us harm because of what we've done in, in helping Canadians to be immunized. 
And then I wrote the article, which was published in the Global Mail last week, which I think has had a great response in terms of other colleagues, other doctors and nurses saying that, yeah, they've been through this as well. They've been threatened, their lives have been threatened, they've been harassed, and they didn't know where to turn. And so starting a conversation, although, you know, there's a risk involved that the college will frown upon my, my speaking publicly, although I don't consider this to be a complaint that I'm speaking about, it's a threat. And it started this conversation about who has our backs and when this line is crossed, when we go from being this hero to being somebody who is totally left on our own in the lurch when somebody says they want to kill us, you know, that doesn't feel so good. What, if anything, are the police doing to protect you? So in my initial conversation with them where they phoned me back four, four days later, they actually phoned me at almost midnight, which was very strange because I wouldn't have answered the phone myself at all. I passed the phone to my husband because it was an unmarked number phoning me at midnight, uh, four days after receiving a death threat. And they said to me, Dr. Kappamurth, I just have to ask, are you Jewish? I said, yeah, I'm Jewish. And they said, okay, well, you know, because of the, the wording in this letter, we may also turn this over to the hate crimes unit and um, we're gonna investigate the death threat. We think that we've identified the person. We think they're within driving distance of where I work. So they asked if I needed to have a police cruiser outside of my home or outside of my office. And like, what is that going to do? I can't have a police cruiser out there all the time. And then what was really sad is the police said that they've you know, been having to send police cruisers to multiple vaccination sites across the city of Ottawa. So what does that say about our society, right? Like we shouldn't need to be boosting security. And this is all before we're even able to immunize the five to 11 year olds. What did the police make any recommendations as to what you should do for your own personal protection? No, other than saying that, you know, I should be increasing security and talking to my kids and talking to my partner. And I mean, like, basically, I, I can't walk to work and home from work on my own anymore. That's ridiculous. As a woman, I have never felt particularly safe walking in the dark on my own, but I would certainly walk, you know, at five o'clock in the evening, even when the dark comes earlier in the winter, I would be walking home on my own and I wouldn't be looking over my shoulder and afraid of, you know, who could be lurking in the shadows. So what I need is to know that the person who said that I should be killed is charged and, you know, held accountable for that kind of behavior. And I don't think that speaking about it is going to cause copycats or is going to increase, you know, how many people are going to try to weaponize the, the college and use the college against doctors. I think it's unless we actually talk about these issues and say that this isn't okay, this is a line that cannot be crossed and you've got to have our backs, then the behavior will continue. If we, if we say it can't happen because we won't tolerate it, then maybe we'll see some change. And unfortunately, we've gotten no support whatsoever from the province, but uh, that's not, not a huge surprise. But my local city councillors and my local MPP and the head of the College of Family Physicians and the head of the Canadian Medical Association, the people who, you know, have stood up and said, we will not tolerate this. I appreciate that. And they wouldn't have known to say it if I hadn't said that this was happening. So, so you feel you're getting a lot of support from colleagues? Yeah, I, a huge amount of support. And and it's not just me. And, and that's the thing is that, you know, as soon as we started talking about this, then the number of doctors and nurses and personal support workers and people working in public health, my colleagues who work in hospitals, you know, it's like not okay for anybody to feel unsafe or to feel harassed because we're doing the work that we were asked to do. Neely, on white coat black art before the pandemic, well before the pandemic, I interviewed a pediatrician in the U.S. who was the target of threats of harm on Facebook for her pro-vaccination beliefs. At that time, we interviewed an American because we couldn't find any similar stories in Canada. That seems to have changed with COVID. And I want to ask you why you think that is. Well, we've seen the increase in organized violence that is all anti-science. It's also anti-intellectual. It's anybody who feels you know, justifiably feels like their lives have been turned upside down. I mean, everyone's lives have been turned upside down by the pandemic, but they're looking for a scapegoat. They're looking for somebody to blame. And so they're blaming, it must be the fault of the doctors. We're also post sort of Trump. It's more 
acceptable today than it was maybe two years ago for people to be out on the streets screaming at doctors. The fact that that is also sort of a crossover with increased anti-Semitism and racism is, it's the same thing. It's You find a scapegoat when we're in times of trouble. There has been racism and sexism in, in medicine long before the pandemic, but the public attacking physicians and attacking nurses and going after public health in this way is like, it's just, it's part of this picture of angry people looking for someone to blame. And that's really pretty easy to do through social media. And now people feel emboldened and they're going off and and doing it in person and through mechanisms like the College of Physicians. We'll be right back. I'm Keith MacArthur. Unlocking Bryson's Brain is a podcast about my son, the rare disease that keeps him from walking or talking. I mean, Bryson's perfect, but his life is really hard. And our family's search for a cure. Oh my gosh, maybe science is ready for this. It's part memoir, part medical mystery. We can do just about anything. Modifying DNA. My heart and my throat. Cure is controversial. Unlocking Bryson's Brain. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to White Coat Black Art. This week, Dr. Neely Kaplan Murth is looking over her shoulder these days after receiving a death threat sent to the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. The threat comes from being pro COVID vaccine and for running vaccination clinics. Since she posted about it on Twitter, Kaplan Murth has discovered she's not the only doctor to be the target of threats. She worries about their long term impact. Neely, you are obviously taking the threat very seriously. Do you think the public is taking these kinds of threats as seriously as they should? Well, now that we're talking about it, I think the public is shocked. Like, I mean, like the average person, the average person who is a decent, kind, respectful person is shocked that these doctors and nurses across Canada and across the States and around the world. And and we're seeing that everywhere. Like you see reports of this in pretty much every country right now that, that doctors are under attack and nurses are under attack. I think people, people are dismayed and supportive. But when somebody says to me, well, Dr. Kaplan, stay safe. I kind of just end up in tears and I'm like, well, what am I, what more am I supposed to do to just stay safe? What we can't do is stop doing our important work. So I'm absolutely still immunizing my patients. And when it's approved for us to immunize kids, I will absolutely be immunizing children. But what I can't do is a Jabapalooza. I can't risk anybody's safety by being out in the public where, where even if it's just one bad apple, somebody comes after us. So people wanted me, all those more than 2000 people that we immunized, they wanted me to also immunize their children. And they absolutely understand that I can't because that would put me in harm's way and my volunteers in harm's way. Neely, I don't want you to put yourself in harm's way. I don't think anybody does. Well, maybe a a small minority of people, but certainly most people listening to this conversation don't want you to put yourself in harm's way. But on some level, doesn't that mean that the protesters win if you stop doing Jabapaloozas? You're not under an obligation to do them. Have you thought about it in those terms? I have. And, you know, depending on my level of energy at any point during the day, I think to myself, oh, to hell with it. We'll still do a job of Palooza. But then I like I can't. I just, you know, if the police could say that this person's been charged and if I had just a little modicum of sense that that there is more security than than just my being um, so stubborn and going on with my work, then I might do it. Last February, I spoke to the prime minister about how we could ensure equity and access so that everybody who wanted to be able to get the vaccine should be able to get the vaccine. So ultimately, I mean, that's what I did last week is I I said, okay, Prime Minister Trudeau, we need to speak again because now all of these fine healthcare workers across Canada need support. And if we don't get it from our provinces and we don't get it on the ground, then then we need it from some higher level. There needs to be some legislation that says like zero tolerance for death threats, that people will be charged, that, you know, when rocks are thrown, people do go to jail. Have you gotten a response from the prime minister? Mm, No, 
But last time when I organized the panel for healthcare workers to speak to him, I then wrote to the prime minister's office directly and said, I'm serious. I really like to do this. And they wrote back and said, yeah, we're serious too. We'll, we'll do it. And I haven't written again, but you know, prime minister has been busy with other things, but we may yet get his ear again. I don't think that there's anybody who would condone violent threats against a doctor or other healthcare workers, but we need people to, to actually act on this and say, you know, that there will be consequences. You received a complaint that was forwarded by the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario and under provincial legislation, you have to respond. So how have you responded? So I have a lawyer who first responded by asking why there was such a delay and has informed me that we are going to hear back as to whether or not they've decided that this is a vexatious complaint. To me, it's a bit dumbfounding that it would have to go to a committee to decide that. Like if you look at this death threat, there is nothing about it anywhere at all that is even remotely a complaint. But we're waiting for that decision. And then we see whether or not they're going to push back against me for having spoken publicly about this. I would. They've told you not to speak publicly about this case? Uh, yeah, because uh, complaints against doctors are supposed to be private, although I'm not sure whose privacy I would be protecting here. There is no patient involved and there is no conduct in, in terms of me other than immunizing people. And I don't feel that I really need to protect the privacy of somebody who threatens to kill me. But I made a choice. I made a choice to speak publicly and I made a choice to be honest and clear about the fact that there shouldn't have been a 12 day delay between when the college received the threat and when they contacted me. And, you know, that that is frowned upon in medicine, as I'm sure you're well aware, there's a hierarchy. We are not supposed to say things aren't okay. And I'm not playing along with the rules. So, so we shall see. In theory, you could be punished for doing that. Well, in theory, they could decide that this is vexatious and then they could still come after me and say, how dare I speak publicly about a college matter? And um, so be it. I don't think this is something that should have ever been anything other than a police matter. You know, I think we can agree that you've, you know, through your Jabapalooza campaigns and your public persona, your persona on social media, you've stuck your neck out. And I want to ask you, as somebody who has done that, where do you think these increasingly aggressive protests against people who are trying to carry the messages of public health policy, good medical policy to manage this pandemic, where do you think they're heading? Well, I, I lie awake at night worrying about that because I worry about my colleagues in the children's hospital having to confront angry mobs when they're able to immunize kids. I worry about my colleagues who, like me, are working in offices in the community. The province of Ontario and the province of Alberta and other provinces have seen doctors stepping up and being more vocal as advocates for the community. We spend our days advocating for patients and now we're advocating for doctors and for our medical system. We we need to be able to respectfully have conversations. And I guess I haven't said that, but we have patients who refuse vaccines before the pandemic. And I have good, healthy, trusting relationships with those patients. Those are not people who would ever be rude, call me names, threaten me ever. And we can agree to disagree, but I'm still there. I'm still providing their care and will continue to do so. You know, there's no way that we would have imagined that there'd be suddenly this this nastiness. It's been there for, for some time, but the pandemic has, has really escalated it. Last thing I want to ask you, Neely, what, what do you say to fellow physicians, nurses, other healthcare providers who might think twice about following your footsteps because of what's happened to you? Well, um, I would say not to give up the work that we need to do out of fear. But I would also say to speak openly and honestly, if you are threatened, um, so that people know that it's happening so that we can effect change. There's medical students who come through my office all the time. And, you know, they are learning a hard lesson when they're seeing the ways in which 
not just I'm being threatened, but, you know, when they're seeing the protests outside of hospitals and all of the rest of it. And our message to those students and, and to our colleagues is, yeah, that's not okay. It's not okay that that's happening. But there are more good people in the world there are, than there are those few people who are choosing to be violent and aggressive and nasty and disrespectful and racist. And as a community of healthcare workers and as a broader community, this is where we need to say that we're in it together and we will together put in a very, very clear line to say, you will not cross this line. You will not attack us. You will not threaten us. And there will be some sort of consequence. So this is the world that we are living in. What can we do to ensure that we're all safe? Dr. Neely kaplan Mirth, thank you so much for speaking with me. My pleasure. Take care. Since that interview, a committee of the college said it won't investigate the complaint against kaplan Mirth because it considers it vexatious, moot, or otherwise an abusive process. The person who made the complaint and the death threat has 30 days to dispute that decision. The Canadian Medical Association is urging Ottawa to establish a new offense in the criminal code to address threats, violence, harassment, and intimidation of healthcare workers. Meanwhile, kaplan Mirth has had a change of heart. Now that Health Canada has approved a COVID vaccine for children ages 5 to 11, she plans on hosting a junior Jabapalooza, a mass vaccine clinic for kids, albeit with extra security. That's our show this week. To comment, email us at whitecoat at cbc.ca. This week on The Dose, Jeffrey Siegel, a professor in the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering at the University of Toronto, helps answer the question how ventilation and air filtration devices can reduce the spread of COVID-19. Here's a sample. Fundamentally, many of the good filters are quite simple. They are a fan and a filter. What I am quite concerned about is there's a lot of manufacturers promoting what I'm going to call unproven technologies, things like bipolar ionization, photocatalytic oxidation, plasma, all kinds of names. And a lot of those air cleaners are simply just not that effective. And in some cases, they actually create harmful byproducts as they operate. White Coat Black Art was produced this week by senior producer Colleen Ross with help from Amina Zoffer, Jeff Goods, and Rachel Sanders. Our digital producer is Ruby Buiza. Technical operations were by Austin Pomeroy. That's medicine from my side of the gurney. I'm Brian Goldman. See you next week. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.